Hey, namaste, I'm Kay, this is Ecstatic Self. I've been doing a lot of talking for the last few months and I thought it was time to hear from some other amazing people. So I'm gonna start introducing to you individuals who I think are doing awesome work in the world regarding spirituality, queerness, embodiment, sensuality, basically all the stuff I talk about in this channel. So today I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. We actually went to college together for a couple of years. His name is Sam Given, and he is a professional actor who works in New York. He's done film, TV, Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater. Uh, he does drag. In his own words, he says that he's learned over and over that success is elusive and, and, a, and definitely not a destination. He identifies as queer, gay, unapologetic as fuck, sober of nine years, partnered for 12. And he says that he is the first to admit that his greatest disappointments open the doors to his biggest blessings. So here's an interview I did with him a couple days ago. I'm so excited to share it with you. Look forward to more stuff like this in the coming weeks. So Sam, thank you so much for joining me today. I would just love to hear you about you in your own words. Well, that's interesting. I haven't had the opportunity to do that in a while. Um, usually, as an actor, you're putting your best foot forward in a cover letter of, you know, I am my credits. Um, yeah. So to hear, to introduce myself as a person, I'm a 33-year-old queer man living in New York City with his husband. Um, I've, I've been with my husband for 12 years, and I've been sober for nine. And I grew up uh, extensively bullied, and I found sanctuary in theater and performing, which then fueled... <laughs> Um, my need for validation and for success. And as we grow, you know, our worlds crumble over and over again and we are asked to either let go of the things that have kept us afloat and grow and expand or stay small. And I've experienced both. So that's kind of what I bring to the table is hitting rock bottom and going either way um, and then doing it over again and over again and over again. <laughs> But finding joy and humor in the process. That's all we have. So I've been on, you know, I've been on Broadway. I've, I've done sh regional theater productions. I've done shows in a, in a back alley, you know, of New York City. And I've also done a lot of my own writing and uh, creating with a, a drag alter ego that I have, which is cabaret shows uh, with parody songs. So that's been really fun as well. I don't know it. What is your drag name? Well, my first drag name was going to be Faggoty Ann because I wanted to take ownership of the word back because I heard it so many times growing up. But uh, my audience are, my audience is actually cis men and women in their 50s and 60s, like baby boomers. So it's milligrams for how many milligrams of Lexapro are you on? Modern medicine, what a miracle. <laughs> uh, I love that you started saying this by, what you started with what you were saying by saying, um, that for you, you're used to introducing yourself by your credits and that being oh. the thing that happens when you step in the door. And what an interesting thing it is for somebody to instead say, tell me about who you are as a person rather than what are the things you've accomplished? Well, look at our, look at our social media and look at how goal oriented we are as a society. It starts with, okay, a picture of you, which is filtered. And then the first thing is, where do you work? Are you married? How old are you and where are you from? I mean, there's no, <laughs> what do you believe in? If you, if you scroll down a little bit more, maybe you'll find that. But I believe, especially where I am, I'm in New York City, we're all, we all present ourselves with what we're working on and what we have to prove. You know, that, that can say, I am worthy of holding space here. And that, for me, that's what queerness is all about, is holding space. Owning space, not asking for it. You know, not asking for being told, not asking to be told who I am. And uh, so queerness has been kind of opening the door to the human and standing on that and that alone. Um, it's still very new to me, but you know, you, you posed the question, I'm glad. No, it's true and I, I love that. Um, and it's a nice reminder for me too, to be very intentional when I meet somebody to, to always ask, you know, not just who are you, what you do do, but what matters to you? Right. What? Um, yeah. Are, you, are you familiar at all with the poem, The Invitation by Orion Mountain Dreamer, by any chance? No, okay, I'm going to have to send it to you. I, I actually read it and dissect it in one of my videos. Um, but it's, it's one of my favorite pieces of poetry. And the author wrote it after being at a party all night where she got sick of those questions. She got sick of people asking like, oh, what do you do? And making this like mindless small talk and always like having to like 
prove yourself in this poem she says i don't want to know those things i want to know the deeper questions i want to know who are you really when you're alone who are you when everything else fades away uh, and we actually used it as part of our wedding ceremony my husband and i oh. so it is a very very special place in both of our hearts so i will send that to you um, one of the things that you also mentioned in your brief little introduction was about being bullied a lot as a kid so i I, it's something I don't think I've talked to you much about, but I know for myself, I view a large part of the person that I am today and why I do the work that I do and why I'm so curious about spiritual growth and empathy and connection and authenticity is from the time I was like six through whenever I was bullied relentlessly about being queer. And I didn't even, like I, had I been in an inclusive environment, I maybe would have been able to own that. But for me, like that was the greatest fear is like people would be like, oh, it's true. And, but it was relentless. Like I, I went home from school pretty much every day sobbing because it's so bad. Um, but I feel like that also is part of what makes me me and how I have grown into who I am. So I would love to hear just a little bit about your experience and how you resonate with then, but also now, how has that changed you? I'll start with now. I think even hearing from you, it's a reminder that I'm not terminally unique. And that was the prison I was in, was that I am the only person experiencing this. I'm defective. I don't belong here. And as we grow and as we find our communities, we learn that our experiences weren't that unique and that we can work through them together. Um, I was, everybody knew something was up about me from the moment I came out of the womb whether it was queer or gay or effeminate or just too much. And um, they all know before I did. So I was bullied from preschool, preschool all the way through college, um, physical abuse, emotional abuse from not only students, but from teachers and adults because they didn't like someone who was, you know, turning kids in for say, strangling them on the playground. Did not feel safe no matter where I was, except for in the theater. Um, and that instantly fueled this skewed vision of where I stood with people, especially people my own age. Either I was above you, because they would say, Sam, they harass you because they're jealous of you. So I was above you because you were jealous of me, or I was below you because I was a fag and I wanted nothing to do with you. So I just said, I will do my own thing. I will stay in my own carefully constructed box that you've put me in, and I will rise to the top like Willy Wonka. And let me just pause you there for a second, because I had that same experience of either they're jealous of you or uh, you're, you know, scum because you're queer. Um, but in either instance, it doesn't allow for a healthy sense of self. No. Because then selfhood is either based on these accolades that you're achieving, right? That now your persona is being tied to the fact that you're smart or talented. Achievement. Achievement. Achievement rather than just being yourself or or then your identity is being tied to your sexuality and and that being dangerous or being less than uh, and i know that's something i've really struggled with in my own life is this how do i cultivate a healthy sense of self that isn't about my achievements that isn't about proving anything to anyone but just knowing that because i exist i am worthy of being treated well because i'm a living creature i am worthy of love and affection and kindness that i don't need to do anything to prove that i i completely agree and to expand on that I think I don't know who I am or what I am worth unless I am connected to the world around me and the people around me, the people that matter to me. It hinges on relationships. So in that time growing up, it was isolation. The, my best friend was a soundtrack to rent in my room while I did, while I did math homework or listening to Delilah, you know, she or watching Oprah. Those were my only real, and then the theater, eventually the theater, which is laced with its own expectations. But it really did get me through. It really got me through middle school and high school. Um, so self-worth and, and belonging uh, for me hinges on relationships. Relationships. And I haven't really been able to form those until I was in my 20s. And it took a lot of time and a lot of back and forth and learning to trust people and learning to trust myself. But that's, that's why I admire you. You're creating right now a community for people to come in and be seen and be heard, but also to listen and identify with others. And I, I respect that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, you know, I really admire you that, you know, you're able to find that you're prioritizing community and relationships, even while pursuing a career as an actor. Because for me, I found <laughs> that I couldn't be both at the same time. 
like I found that I would have to choose one or the other. Right. And, and maybe that was a false choice. Maybe I didn't actually, but that's, that's what I heard from the successful people, at least Same. in LA. Same. And I didn't want that. I, I said, at the end of my life, I think the thing that's going to make me happy are my relationships and loving oh, yes. people. And, and I want that. Uh, and that was my reason for moving away from the arts, but I love that you're able to hold that intention and continue to wrangle with this idea of validation, right? like seeking validation through being an actor and hold all those things while at the still, same time still staying in the melu. Melu, 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 why can't I say that? I like it. <laughs> uh, or like how, can you, how do you stay in the fight while also realizing that this in some ways is a little bit your kryptonite, at least it is for me, right? Like the thing is, is I want validation and I'm in a career that's giving me that, but I also realize it's a fake form of validation, but I'm still gonna fight that fight while also trying to maintain really positive, healthy relationships. Like how do I have it all? I, uh, oh I, I, man. How do, how do you do that? I that's love the, that. I, that's the struggle. And it's something I grapple with on a moment by moment basis, because I'm human, I'm human. And it's good to have those instincts and it's, you know, jealousy, I used to shy away from it. Like I am bad for being jealous, but it shows that I care about something. And then I need to, I need to reorient where I'm going with that. But you said something, you're fighting the fight. And I think for me, it is remembering what I am fighting for. And for the longest time, it was success, the elusive success. When I could turn around, be at the top of the stairs and turn around and look at everybody who didn't understand me and say, I told you so. And unfortunately, the people I was in competition with were my peers, and they had to go down those stairs too, in order for me to, in my head, rise to the top. Now, as I've learned over time, and I've had small successes, they never filled that void I was so desperately seeking to fill. And the only thing that kept me afloat was my relationships. So what I'm fighting for right now is community and a sense of belonging in the community. And when I don't feel like I belong, how can I reapproach the work I'm doing? So that's sometimes showing up for other people, even if I have to grit my teeth while I do it, or creating work and creating opportunities for my friends. And then honestly, sometimes it is just stepping back, stepping back and working on my gratitude and looking at how far I've come. Um, Cause like you, I mean, to come from trauma and then to try to make a life work in any field especially the one of performing, which is so inherently competitive to begin with, the way it's set up, it takes a lot of, of courage and bravery and self-love. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share about this and you can edit this out if you want. Like we both went to a very competitive college and from the get-go when we arrived, that sense of you against everybody else was, was instilled in the program. You, at the end of your first year, you audition for the musical theater program, which only takes 10 people, I don't know, 15, 10 to 15 people out of like 150. So the whole year is spent fretting over, am I going to get into this program or am I not? And that, I, I played that game of, am I going to get in? Am I not? How do I put, posit myself so that I am at the front of the line? And I lost everybody. I lost all my friendships uh, so that by the second year I was completely alone and I dropped out because I was lonely and broken. I didn't know who I was without the people I, without my community. So oh, that's, that's interesting that you say that because my experience was a little bit different of that first year because I, yeah. I didn't feel successful. Like I wasn't invited into the community. And I remember once getting sent an email from during freshman year where the head where I like had the group name accidentally attached and it said like musical theater backups like like the B group group and I was in that group um and so like I remember getting in and me and everybody else being shocked being like really they let him in he was one of the only ones um so that was not my experience I remember having the opposite of like oh maybe people will like me now and actually include me and then that was not the case no a lot of welcome <laughs> <laughs> but so it's interesting to hear someone else's experience because right from the outside in they'd be like oh wow look at this person he has lots of friends he's really included in this community he's feeling welcomed but on the inside it sounds like you were feeling like you were having to make a lot of uncomfortable choices to get you to that place and ultimately sacrifice your well-being i was i was and and to lift the veil i was completely left out from the very get-go i i fought to get into that dinky little program which is wonderful but um, 
it, I had to be calculating and try and get into every show that would get on the radar of, you know, the musical theater director. And I was miserable. And I think the thing that killed me was, so we got into this program and then it's, okay, now you have three years to compete with your people in this program to get into the senior showcase. And I said, I can't, I can't sustain that for three years. I can't sustain this hunger <laughs> and competitiveness for three years. I'll burn out. I guess for me, I ended up being very grateful because I did not have a good experience in my acting classes. We were in the same acting class as well, I know. Oh, were we really? Yeah, we both had Gail. <laughs> oh my God, I forgot. I did not have a good experience of that and I ended up leaving her class junior year because, which you're not supposed to do, you're supposed to stay in the same acting class all three years. Um, but the music theater acting classes were my lifeline. Like I felt like that was like teaching me actual skills and I was feeling like I was able to grow because my, my regular acting class was not giving me that. So um, Senior Showcase was definitely out there. For those of you who don't know, Senior Showcase was basically, they take like the top like 10 people from your year. Anyone can do it, but um, 10 top 10 people and bring them to New York and then sometimes LA and uh, show them off to casting and people and agents. Uh, I did not get into it. Uh, Sam had transferred to another school before then. Um, so yeah, I want to circle back to two things that you highlighted when you were talking about this. Uh, so one of the things you said was you're wrangling with validation, you're wrangling with a career that um, is about achieving. And the two things that have really kept you grounded is one of being of service, like trying to make it about helping other people to not just be about yourself, but living in generosity. And then I believe the flip side of living in generosity is gratitude, she mentioned, which is seeing how much we already have. Um, so I'd love to hear you just talk about those two things. Well, first, living in generosity. Um, I'm not always able to be generous, but, but, <laughs> but when, I, when I feel myself drifting off the rails, that's where I go immediately. Service immediately gets me out of myself. Um, the monkey brain where one side is creating bullshit and the other side's buying it. So if I can bypass that by connecting with another human, that's when I hear what I need to hear, grace. And so in the industry, that was hard for me in the beginning because I was constantly on all the industry websites looking at who was getting cast and then drinking at my computer screen in, in fury. But, but how I do it today is, is simply by listening to people, calling people up that I care about and asking them how they're doing. And something immediately shifts for me. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it is totally chemical and emotional and spiritual. And I start breathing. And what I find is that the more space I make for other people, somehow space is granted to me as well. And my, the thing I learned over the past decade of being here is that my work is contingent on my relationships. That's where my best work comes from. Sure, there will be the fluke where I go in and audition for a random stranger and they respond to something, but most of my work is based on who I know and who I've worked with. And that's and I get joy out of that. So that, I, that's why I lean into it so heavily. Also, because, because it fosters gratitude, because I am reminded of where I've been on this journey of, of finding myself in New York City and as a performer and continually evolving. So the gratitude I, I simply go to is like, thank you for the house above my head, the, the roof. Thank you for food in my refrigerator. Thank you for my husband for staying with me while I do 16 bars in the shower every single day. <laughs> you know, thanks for my cat. Thank you for my hair. You know, thank you for that I can get out my front door today without feeling severely crippled by God, I got to get it and God, I have to prove something. You know, thank you that I have the opportunity to put my best self forward today and nearly offer something. What a gift that is. People are holding space for me to offer something. And whether they respond to it or not, it's not up to me. I can show up today. And that's why I have gratitude. That's that's what gratitude fosters is just showing, being able to show up. Whether it's for other people or for myself. There's a practice that is one of my favorites that I do called um, being somebody's secret champion. Where oh. like I go to a room and I don't even know you, but I'm going to like wish you all the best success in the world. Yeah. Uh, and you actually even think about like, there's a Buddhist practice called Metta meditation, which is about, I wish well for I myself, I wish well for my family, I wish well for all sentient beings. But I love this idea of like, you know, instead of going into the competitive mindset, what if we walk in and say, I want you to succeed. I want you to be living your best life. And even in these moments, like an audition where it feels like direct competition, really it's, it's not. 
It's not. And I'm, and I'm a big believer. Model. It's the scarcity yeah. model. We believe that there is a limited amount of access to this community world that we're creating. And this applies to any industry. And that our, that our belonging is contingent on beating out other people. But really, it's a world of abundance. There are no limitations. There's room for everybody. And everyone pops and clicks at a different time. It's a symphony. It's a, like a firework show. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I definitely find that the things that I didn't get, that I thought I needed or thought I wanted, in hindsight, I'm so grateful that I didn't get them. Like, had I gotten them, I probably would have been miserable. Well, it's like the hero's journey. You know, you either you don't get it and you learn to change, or you get it and you realize it didn't solve the problem. And I've had both. <laughs> like, you know, I, 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 you know, 10 years of being here, I got a call that I was making my Broadway debut, and I expected a parade to go off inside me. And, and it never came. It never came. I've had more gratifying performances performing, you know, in my hometown in a community theater show than I did on Broadway. So what does that say? You know, it's not about the external. It's about what's going on in here. That was a great experience. I'm just saying I had put so much weight on that to give me right. what I needed and right. then was left feeling like, is that all there is? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's the, the term for it is the arrival fallacy that will arrive and suddenly yes. everything will be golden and realize, no. And then it goes back to that connection, right? Like performing in your hometown with people who love you and support you and think you're all oh, that in a bag of chips, right? Completely. Or just getting to change people's minds, you know? Yeah. Getting, to, getting to be a leader in a different community, you know? Yeah. I'm not ruling one against the other, just as it's remembering that my greatest satisfaction will be my connection to the work and the connection to the people around me, not where it is or what caliber it's at. Which I'm glad I learned now. <laughs> I know, right? Better now than uh, 50 years from now. <laughs> Or never. I could go. I have that. I have that engine that could go all the way and and not get what he wants and just keep fighting until there's you know to the death without with missing my life. You know. So what do you th so what do you think triggered that in you? What triggered for you that ability to stop and reflect and realize? Because there's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of people who think, okay, if I hit this milestone, if I get ten thousand followers on Instagram, I'm going to be happy. But it doesn't. So then they go for a more audacious one, like well, a hundred thousand, a million. What's next? Uh, what's Broadway next? What's didn't next? Do it? What's next? Well, I need the Tony. The Tony's right. the big deal, right? So what, what is it for you that made you stop and say, hmm, maybe this isn't it, since you say you have the proclivity to do it that? It was a specific experience. I was attached to a show for three years. Um, you know, like I, this was when I was putting all of my validation on the roles that I was and getting. Was this, you playing David Bowie? No, that was just a wonderful thing that fell into my lap, which was a very joyous thing uh, oh, post, okay. post that. I, this experience broke me and opened me up. I was involved with a, a punk rock musical. Um, and I was involved for three years, and they wrote a role for me that I helped them create. And I put all of my eggs in that basket, all of them. And I, and I neglected my relationships. I neglected my health. Uh, I, I put everything on pause because this was going to be the thing. And then right before the last industry showcase, before we were gonna to transfer to Broadway, I found out online that I'd been replaced. <laughs> and not only was it having the dream taken away, it was that no one reached out to me from that team to let me know they were letting me go. And no one from the cast. So I had created this false sense of community and this false sense of belonging my fault. I had put it there and expected it to be my new home and it was gone. And that wasn't bottom for me. Bottom was the subsequent months where I realized that I had nothing. My life was empty. I mean, thank God I had my husband. He's everything. And I had my cat and I had my sobriety and I had family. But in terms of creating, nothing. Nothing. Um, and I, I decided I never want to feel this way again. Um, it doesn't mean I don't go for big things. It doesn't mean I don't have aspirations, but I never want to feel that my work, my life, my spirit, my space is contingent on one opportunity. It just, it's, it's prison, you know? And, uh, and in breaking like that, I had to come to terms with my trauma. The reason I was fighting so hard to break through, which was, which was, which was, to feel like I was worthy, to finally feel safe. Because my body was still responding to the trauma of growing up. I didn't feel safe. 
And I thought that this would do that. So instead I got into therapy. I jumped harder into my 12-step work. And I slowed down. And I, I found me in the shadow. I, the things I was running from, I found me. So that's what really did it for me. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm going to leave the industry. Maybe this isn't what I want. But I found, no, I love performing. I love the community. I love watching people grow and meet their saboteur and push through. That's, that's what gives me joy. That's what gives me spark. But it was just learning to be safe and feel safe and feel worthy without that credit. And that took three years. That took three friggin' years from being let go to watching that show, you know, reach its zenith and close and do what it needed to do. But um, thank God. You know, I felt like that was my biggest failure and it was my biggest blessing. My biggest blessing, because I got to expand. And it's like queerness, you wait. I waited for someone to finally tell me I was worthy. And I realized, no, that wasn't anyone's responsibility. And how dare I lend my power to someone like that? How dare I? It's inside, you know, and it's time to start, to start cultivating that. So a couple questions for you following up on that. One, how do you connect with this idea of safety now? Like, obviously you've grown into it and developed mechanisms to help you feel safe, but you also live working and live in an industry and in a city where that is not part of the job description, right? Like there is, <clears throat> when you get cast in a job, great. It will last for either a couple of days, a couple of months, if you're lucky and it's almost unheard of a couple of years, but you're always, there's no stability in that. No, you're always <laughs> looking, you're always hustling. But also this idea of safety as a queer man living in Manhattan, where, you know, I live in DC right now. I've also lived in LA and Chicago and briefly Florida. Um, but there is this element of showmanship in queer spaces. And this idea of, well, one way to make ourselves feel more safe is to look a certain way or achieve a certain type of body or to be a certain blank, a certain type. So how does that resonate for you? Because like I know for myself as a gay man, even somebody who doesn't go into a lot of traditionally queer spaces, like I don't like going to clubs or bars, um, you know, I still like, you know, part of the reason I like working out is one, I like how I look and I like how I feel, but there is also that element of societal approval that comes and the power that's given when you fulfill a certain type of role. So I would love for you to talk about safety and then also about your experience of being, uh, in your own words, a queer as fuck man. Um, <laughs> and yeah, if you could dive into all that for me. Yeah, so the first question, I'm just gonna break it down because I, my, my wheels are a-turning, uh, was about feeling safe in the industry and feeling safe in, okay. So, I mean, that one was, was building a life outside of my work, that I am not my work, and finding creativity and finding creative joy outside of the hustle and bustle of auditioning. So I write, I found that I love writing. And when I get in contact with my creative practice, I'm able to tap into something higher and it works through me and it is not for anyone. And sometimes I share it and sometimes I don't, but it is for me. So creative practice is a big one. Yoga and exercise is a big one. Taking care of myself, going to the doctor, going to the dermatologist, going to the dentist. I'm married, so I have great insurance. Sorry to brag about that, but it's one of the perks. <laughs> it is one of the perks. And then also just giving myself the time and the space to find joy in whatever way that looks at, whether it's watching a Netflix show, doing a puzzle, taking a walk, doing a face mask. It's just remembering that I am a human being before I am a human doing. And that's how I feel safe because the human doing tricks the gotta outrun, gotta outrun. They're chasing you. They're chasing you. They're chasing you. And I don't, I, no one's chasing me today. And so that plays into being queer as fuck and having to fill roles. Now for me, queer, it means a lot of different things for everyone. I'm still grappling with what the hell it means. Um, there's the physical, there's the emotional, there's the spiritual. I felt I, I played more roles and put myself in more boxes as a gay man. Before I had even found love or gone in the dating pool or done any of that, I was immediately told, you are a twink. So a twink is skinny as fuck, you know, feminine, perfect skin, perfect hair, but, but primarily feminine and small and, and subservient to a, you know, like a mask, either older or muscly dude. So I played that role. 
And when I got married, it was like housewife, you know? So I'm going to do all of the cleaning and the cooking and the drinking at home, waiting for husband to come home and then, you know, bring out a casserole. Like, these were the roles that I learned. And, and it was the same in auditions. It was like, you are a twink, you are the gay best friend, you are the gay assistant, you are a self-deprecating fag, or you're a drag queen. Because that's what your body type says, that's what your voice sounds like. And queerness to me was saying, uh-uh. I'm a, I am, and it's not saying masculine or feminine, it is saying I am, not, I am no longer wounded and small and taking up less space based on what you ascribe to me. I am empowered. I am on my own two feet. I am both masculine and feminine, but I am not wounded anymore. I don't need to, I don't need to apologize and make myself small for you to feel comfortable. And the, the most recent experience I can think of that is I, you know, I dabble in fitness instruction, great way to make money on the Upper East Side, and most of the people that come in are cis men in their 50s and 60s and, and their wives. And I immediately felt uncomfortable before I really started exploring the queer thing and what that meant to me. So I became Richard Simmons. You know, it's like, if you're funny, if you wear tights, if you're non-threatening, then you can hold space here. And that's exhausting when it, does, when it doesn't align with who you are. Now, Richard Simmons is authentically... Richard Simmons, but that's not me. So queerness and feeling safe is knowing that I am a strong, beautiful, glamorous, fabulous, masculine being, and no one can diminish me. They can try to hurt me. They can, they can, they can come for me physically or emotionally, but I am strong. I'm a human, and I'll deal with it the way a human does, rather than a bullied victim. I'm not a victim anymore. And for some reason, gay culture, gay community, I did not feel safe there. <laughs> uh, I did not feel safe being being told that I had to be, behave a certain way in order to earn love, respect, and community. And I think I think queer space is is much more open. And I also think that it's. I don't need to simply be in a queer space in order to feel accepted. I can be queer wherever the fuck I want to be. You know? That's what comes to mind. It's a stream of conscious. Uh, no, there's great. That's what comes to mind. Things, um, there's a couple things I want to highlight in there. And first, I also want to share, you know, I thought, you know, I started entering the gay world uh, around 24, 25 when I started my coming out experience. Um, I never got pigeonholed into a box. Like, I never, no one would ever see me be like, oh, you're a twink or you're an otter or you're a fox or dash hound or whatever, know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right? like everyone was always like i don't know where to put you and to be fair that was my entire experience as an actor too they're always like who are you not sure which box you go in you're a little too a little bit of i don't know what you're interesting <gasps> let's call it interesting um so i never had that experience of being expected to conform to a certain stereotype or never felt like i walk into a space and people expected me to be blank. Um, and maybe it's just I didn't interact with those spaces enough to get pigeonholed. Um, but so it's interesting to get to hear your experience because it's not one I've gotten to live in. It's, it's really interesting and I think beautiful to hear about you reckoning with that and wrangling with that. Um, yeah. there, there are two other things I want to highlight that you brought up too. Is you brought up one of my favorite phrases, which is, we aren't human doings, we're human beings. Uh, and I, there's a quote I love, which is, busy is a drug many people are addicted to. Do you find that as you tap more into being a, to being a human being rather than a human doing, do you feel like that helps you live your best life? We, we, I know one of the things we said we want to talk about today was resiliency, and coming back to your best self, overcoming disappointment. Do you feel like getting out of the doership helps you with that? Uh, and the other thing I want to ask you about that you brought up is this idea of masculinity, like talking about owning your masculine energy. And I think for people who are unversed in what masculine energy is, they tend to think it means butch or it means cowboy boots and swearing and muscles <laughs> john wayne <laughs> john wayne they think that's what donald trump that's what they certain people think masculinity is but in reality masculinity is a much more colorful dynamic interesting energy so i would love to hear you talk about what masculinity means to you so human doing masculinity a little resilience go Human doing versus human being. Well, I think that I think right now in this time, this pandemic has forced me to slow down and really look at 
human doing versus human being. And the way I approached the first, you know, month or two was like, I'm going to write a screenplay and I'm going to take all these acting classes and I'm going to network because I've got to make the best of this time, but I've also got to run from my feelings. You know, that, that impulse, I don't believe will ever go away. That's a human impulse to run and numb. And, and can I just say as a person yes. who a lot of self inquiry, the hardest thing for me to do is say, I'm just going to sit here on the couch and be with myself. Oh, Even like, it's, it's like, like I meditate every day. I meditate, oh. but it's still like goal oriented. It's like, I'm going to sit for 30 minutes. I'm going to do a yeah. mantra. But to just simply oh, yeah. be like, I'm going to do literally nothing is like the hardest thing in the world. No, I completely agree. Like when I watch movies or TV shows with my husband, I'm usually like on my phone, on my computer, and also like, you know, Marie Kondo in a box of some sort of socks. Um, and I, yeah, one of my first introductions to just sitting and watching, I watched the Star Wars anthology because I was like, I've never seen this, I should get into it. And um, it's the first time I really sat on the couch and just enjoyed myself. And I hadn't felt that way in a really long time. What it did do, and what the hard part is, is it, the more I sit with myself, the more things come up. The things I've been, I've been holding so near and dear to my chest and the things that are blocked deep down in my lower abdomen, you know, in my root, that I thought, if I just shut a box on this, I will be fine. So, my living my best life, let's see, I think it's maybe living my most connected life, my most human life, my most authentic life. Um, I've, I, I find time to sit with feelings, to, to let them wash over me and go through. And I don't do that alone. I do that in therapy and I do that with the people I love, mm -hmm. but I also do it alone, you know, and to really recognize what my body is telling me, which, you know, here, especially in this, day and age, it's like adrenaline overdose. You know, my, my adrenal glands are just slamming, slamming, slamming. No wonder my body is breaking down every three months. So learning how to sit back and, and take care of my health, take care of my mind, take care, take care of my spirit, because I know when I do that, I have more to offer, you know, not just to the craft, but to my relationships. Um, and, and I still relate to that too. You do. I, oh, you I do, do too. For, for years, I was constantly getting sick and constantly breaking down because it was about, it was about disconnection, right? It was about yes. I have to do, I have to do, I have to do, but not actually taking that time to be, to be here. No, no. And that's where, that's where the strength comes from. I mean, it's not all doom and gloom and pain. You know, we, we've let these feelings come up. I've let these feelings come up and I, I have found attributes that I, thought would threaten my safety, like my strength, like my, my pure confidence. You know, it was one thing to be self-deprecating, one thing to make a joke of myself, one thing to make an apology. It was another thing to stand there and, and to accept a compliment and say thank you and to know that it was true, that I, you know, that I was worthy. So owning my power. And I, uh, so the masculine feminine thing Oh boy, I, I think they go together. For me, it's wounded and empowered. You know, there's, 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 there's wounded feminine for me, which is like, please God save me, the maiden in the tower. There's the wounded masculine who is suppressing things and it comes out sideways through sex, through alcohol, through, through, you know, the only way I felt I could express that was in indiscretion and things that would bring me shame these carnal desires, the desire to be around other men, the desire to expose my body to other men, the desire to find um, brotherhood with other men. It had to come with alcohol, it had to come with sex, it had to come with drugs. So that's to me the wounded masculine. It had to be dark and it had to be cruel. And the empowered feminine for me is nurturing, um, Primarily nurturing because I also deal with a lot of body stuff. So it's learning how to take care of yourself and give yourself the sustenance that you need in order to be fully realized, to be loved, to be held, to be cradled. Um, and and the empowered masculine is to be able to stand on my own two feet and walk out my front door and to look people in the eye. That's what it looks like to me. Um, 
I found masculine in doing David Bowie work. I, I got to play David Bowie uh, for three years touring the country, doing like a tribute show as Ziggy Stardust, and I had no idea who he was. I only knew David Bowie from The Labyrinth. Um, so it was kind of kismet that I got to play him because I had, I had kind of found myself in David Bowie's shoes without knowing who he was. And, and it just, I was like, oh my God, I had no idea a person like this existed. So to be on stage and to be wearing full glitter and, and makeup and lashes and to be joyous and free and sending energy out like that felt very masculine to me. To be, to be connected to my body, to feel sexual with abandon, without apologizing, without feeling like I needed to go to confession and <laughs> scrub myself down in silkwood. Holy moly, what an awakening. That's masculine to me, you know? And, and they, fuse, they fuse together and they, they even out, they balance. Um, yeah, I've often said that one of the joys of identifying as queer, and I, and I use queer to mean, you know, anywhere on the rainbow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Queer is saying that there are no rules anymore of what you can and can't do. There are no more rules about what is masculine, what is feminine, that you have to be a certain way. It's saying, taste all the flavors. Do whatever you want. Live in your energy that feels authentic to you. But one of the beautiful experiences is by doing that, by, by trying the other sides, by shifting the balance, it's, there's, there's a, for me, it's almost like a gateway to something higher. Because if you live in a world of polarity where I can only exist on this one side, uh, then you need someone else to complete you, to find union, right? You need your opposite. But when you exist within the rainbow of queerness, then you have the the polarity already within you, you have both sides within you. And when you're already in that state of balance, maybe that can open you up to a higher state of being. Expansion. Expansion. Yeah. Which falls into my theory that all queer people in history would have been the shamans, the healers, the storytellers. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Like I feel like that's part of our DNA and that's also part of why there's so much trauma in the queer community is the disconnection from that. Disconnection from our mystical heritage that we're meant to be holding. Oh, I I really love that. <laughs> that makes me think of I know this is so trite, but it does make me think of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. How you know he he connected with that ancient calling, you know, to, to inhabit yeah. space. That is my favorite husband's favorite musical. Uh, I so sang it to him. I sang to him "Origin of Love" as part of our wedding ceremony. <gasps> Do you have a tape of this ceremony? Because I would love to see it. The wedding ceremony started at 4 a.m. and went to 11 p.m. So it was, oh. it was I'll have to tell you the story next wow. time. We'll wow. do a video. I just want to say how much I love your energy, love your enthusiasm, love the, the way that you are bringing all of yourself to the world and to, and to some really beautiful, beautiful vantages from a very beautiful soul. So I want to say thank you for sharing your thoughts today. That means the world. And I adore you, I think what's so magic is, you know, we, we did cross paths in school, as you reminded me. I was uh, completely in a different world by that last semester, but to see what you are becoming and the space you are creating and how much of service you are being is, is beyond inspiring to me. And I can see the work that you've done personally and are doing and um, tells me to keep going, you know? Because I, to feel connected to you like this three years after college uh, feels so wonderful. And um, I hope it continues. I really do. Thank you. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have a wonderful one.